Okay, hi, my name is Dr. Scott Gold, and I'm an ear, nose, and throat specialist. Um, I've been practicing uh, otolaryngology in Manhattan for approximately uh, 35 years. And uh, I want to uh, thank Dr. Rubin for inviting me. Uh, my topic today is going to be hearing loss. And I thought um, uh, what I'm going to do is give a, a background about what causes hearing loss, and then we'll discuss um, you know, what the potential treatments are, and then of course, I'll be, uh, uh, we'll answer any questions that anybody has. Um, so I've been treating patients with hearing loss for about uh, 35 years, um, and during that time, I uh, have seen a lot of changes in both the diagnosis and the treatment for hearing loss. Uh, I have a sort of a unique perspective because I myself have a, what we call a moderately severe hearing loss and I use hearing aids. And without hearing aids, I have a very difficult time carrying on a conversation. So for the last probably 25 years, I've experienced all the different types of hearing aids and all the innovations. Uh, the issue, I think, for a lot of people is what is hearing loss? I mean, you know, you know you're not getting the information, but uh, to a lot of people, I find they suspect that hearing loss might be just everything sounds low, low volume, but uh, that's not necessarily the case. Another uh, thing that I hear an awful lot, uh, including from physicians, I hear fine. I just don't understand the words. But that's really what hearing loss is. So we had a lecture uh, at one point in our practice by a, uh, um, uh, a composer who was mostly deaf and uh, wasn't Beethoven, but he was really interesting. And he showed this slide. And when I show you this slide, this really hit me. And, and I, when I show it to people who are hearing impaired, it tends to really uh, get to them as well. Perfect hearing looks like this, and then on the other side it says impaired hearing looks like this. So you sort of hear the words, but it's just difficult to make them out. And that can be very frustrating, uh, you know, asking why all the time, not really getting the uh, gist of the conversation. So I just want to go quickly through the uh, prevalence of uh, hearing loss. So uh, about 50 million Americans have significant hearing loss. So one out of three people um, over 65 have hearing loss, that's significant, and two out of three people over 75 have hearing loss. What's interesting is that about 15% of people age 45 to 64 also have hearing loss. So hearing loss is a really common uh, uh, problem or just fact of life, we should say. I just want to mention tinnitus. So that tinnitus, which we'll talk about in a second, you know, is ringing in the ears or uh, sounds or perceptions of sound in the ears or the head. And that affects about 50 million people. Um, there's been a lot of research done recently uh, in John, at Johns Hopkins led by Dr. Frank Lynn, who's a, an otolaryngologist and researcher. And his area of interest, uh, he's an otologist, he does ear surgery and takes care of a lot of people with hearing loss. But his, uh, one of his big areas of interest were the, the, the sequela of hearing loss. And many articles have been published. A lot of it has made its way into the lay literature. Um, so the findings with, in, with Dr. Lin's group, and this has been substantiated with other work, is that the incidence of dementia in patients who have hearing loss, particularly hearing loss that's not treated. So the incidence of dementia uh, has been uh, shown as well as diminished physical and mental health. Uh, people with hearing loss, particularly untreated hearing loss, tend to have more falls. They have more hospitalizations. And what's really striking is they've proved on MRIs that people actually develop atrophy of the brain after a period of time. So uh, Dr. Lin, excuse me, yeah, Dr. Lin, you know, feels that hearing loss can be another hit on the brain and we want to try to treat it before we get these structural changes in the brain that are permanent that we find on the MRI. 
Here's a flow sheet that Dr. Lin came up with. And it just, just briefly to show you how all these different factors really interact with one another. You know, the common thing is with aging, people often have microvascular disease, the small blood vessels in the body tend to uh, be diseased and not function well. Uh, and basically speaking that this, this uh, is sort of the substrate, but patients who have this with hearing loss, they tend to have difficulty with cognition. Uh, as I said, there's been changes in brain stru uh, structure and function that's been proven. Uh, this can lead to impaired cognitive functioning, poor physical functioning, and in general, uh, a poorer quality of life. I, I know personally, I've seen many patients, uh, many people, even in my own family, who, who had been very active, outgoing people who have lost their hearing, didn't treat it. And then you'd see them with a group just sort of sitting on the side off to themselves because they really couldn't follow what was going on. And then when the hearing loss is treated, they often sort of come back to life. So it makes sense, I think, that if you're not hearing well, understanding well, you can't participate. So I just want to start with the brief uh, dis uh, discussion of how the ear works, how hearing works. So basically, this is a cross-section uh, of uh, the skull and ear. So we see the outer ear which has many names, there's different parts to it. But the outer ear collects the sound and sort of funnels it into the ear canal. Uh, so the outer ear and the ear canal are known as the outer ear. And the ear canal itself is lined with skin. It can have a little bit of hair in it. It has glands that produce cerumen or earwax, the purpose of which is to protect the ear canal. Uh, at the end of the ear canal, we have the eardrum, also called the tympanic membrane. So this is a very thin translucent, translucent structure, and, on the, and it's actually made from uh, skin, like in the ear canal, on the side that faces the ear canal, there's skin. And then on the other side of the uh, eardrum, it, it has a different type of a lining tissue. So basically, the middle ear, the ear canal and the eardrum are here. And then on the other side of the eardrum, we have the, the ossicles, the malleus, the incus, the stapes. We used to call them the hammer and the anvil and the stirrup. Now, basically, the middle ear is a, is a space that's filled with air, and it's connected to the nose through the eustachian tube. And that's why we often blow our nose or try to get some pressure in our ear. So basically what happens is the, the sound wave uh, moves the eardrum that moves these little bones, which are a lever mechanism. So that really amplifies the uh, sound energy. And then finally, we have the inner ear. Now the inner ear looks like a snail. We have this portion here, and we have an uh, area up here called the semicircular canals. These are the areas that are involved with balance, and they have the little crystals that float in them. So that's why some people will develop what's known as uh, benign positional vertigo. Uh, that's when the crystals fall out of place. The patient would lie back, turn their head, become very dizzy, go back, and it would stop. That's the most common form of dizziness. But our conversation today is really about the hearing. So the hearing portion of the inner ear is, is, uh, is this area here called the cochlea. The cochlea is a very dense bone, uh, uh, and the, inside it is a, what they call the membranous labyrinth. I'll show you in a minute. But the thing to notice is that the, the end of the little middle ear bones, the uh, stapes, is, is, uh, has, is, um, is up against the cochlea. There is a window, a bony window. Let me, just, uh, let me just stop for a minute. So basically as the eardrum moves and the bones move, it um, activates a fluid wave because the uh, little bone, the stapes, is, 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 is uh, moving in and out and uh, sending the fluid in the inner ear uh, moving. This is a, a picture of the eardrum through an otoscope. And just to show you, you can see that this area here is one of those bones, the malleus. It's almost like the, uh, the thin, healthy, translucent eardrum is draped over it. So we can see it. And this is a spot here called the umbo, which I'm gonna come back to later. 
So uh, the way hearing generally works is the sound is um, uh, concentrated from the external ear. The sound wave goes through the middle ear. The eardrum starts vibrating. The middle ear bones, the hammer and the anvil and the stirrup, they start vibrating. And then the, there's a little window where, oh, I'm sorry, I'm having a problem with this. Um, a little window where this bone moves in and out and gets the fluid in the inner ear moving. Uh, in the inner ear, uh, I should say in the middle ear, you can see the, those bones we talked about, but the bone has been removed in this picture, and you can see that the, the cochlea is just a membrane, even though it's encased in bone, it's like a balloon, and it has a liquid in it called perilymph. So as this goes in and out, it starts a fluid wave inside the cochlea, and the cochlea is lined with the hair cells. The hair cells are these microscopic little structures that line the entire uh, circular pattern of the cochlea. And as the, um, excuse me, and as the fluid wave moves, it displaces the, air, the hair cells, and they then turn that mechanical energy into electrical energy. So the, uh, the, hearing, uh, the hearing information uh, from the cochlea is sent by a nerve called the auditory nerve or the eighth cranial nerve. And that sends it into the brain stem and then up with, with different uh, neural connections into the brain. And then in the uh, top of our brain, we have what's called the side, I should say, is the auditory cortex where all this is processed. So I want to start talking about hearing loss. And this is the newest type of hearing loss we've come into. And I think it's related to masks because people are all of a sudden realizing that when they can't read lips, they can't hear. So this may be the cure for this type of hearing loss. So the causes of hearing loss are several. Uh, first, first of all, uh, a very common problem uh, is earwax. So impacted earwax can really obstruct the hearing. Uh, and I just wanna go through that a little bit. So basically you can see on this cross section, uh, this is an ear with a lot of earwax, a cerumen in the canal, and this would prevent the sound from getting through. Um, unfortunately, most people think that by using a Q-tip, they're gonna remove the wax, but you can see from this diagram that it really would just push the wax in further. So in addition to that, we also see quite a few Q-tip injuries. So the q I tell my patients the Q-tip is not magnetic. It's no way it could pull the, the, the earwax out. So there are kits that people use. The problem with these is that while they soften the wax, unless the patient is willing to use a, the syringe that they include and really wash it out, it, it usually is not that effective. In fact, the hearing often gets worse temporarily before it gets better. Uh, we also irrigate the ear with water, or we'll often under a microscope use an instrument, a curette, and get beyond the wax and then just pull it out. So it's really something that has to be done with some experience and some skill. Uh, so the, the other uh, causes of hearing loss, just to go through them quickly, one is infection. So if someone has a cold and the eustachian tube gets blocked, usually they'll get an infection with fluid in the middle ear. Uh, it could be a bloody fluid or it could be pus. But that often affects, but that will affect the hearing loss, the hearing, because the, those bones have to be in an air contained space. When they're in fluid, they don't work properly and the hearing goes way down. Um, another type of infection that could lead to hearing loss is what's called external otitis or swimmer's ear. And that's when the skin of the ear canal gets infected and it can become, it's very painful, but it become very small and it affect the hearing as well. Another common hearing problem we see is called sudden hearing loss, and it's just what it sounds like. It's called sudden sensory neural hearing loss, and this is when all of a sudden, uh, sort of instantaneously, the hearing will drop, and usually in one ear at a time. The patients often are aware that they're not hearing well, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes they just feel a fullness or a pressure in their ear. They usually get tinnitus, the loud you know, noise in the ear. Um, and this is usually considered to be an autoimmune thing. Not that patients have long-term autoimmune problems. It's treated with steroid medicines. And, the re and if it's treated within the first six weeks, uh, the results are very good. The problem is often patients will be seen 
by someone who's not experienced and the patient's not hearing and having ringing and the person examining them will say, oh, you have fluid in your ear when they don't. And sometimes you miss the opportunity to treat that. Another uh, relatively common issue, or it's not, not as common as age-related hearing loss, is Meniere's disease or Meniere syndrome. And that's a, a problem where people tend to have recurrent episodes of hearing loss, loud tinnitus, and severe, severe dizziness, vertigo with nausea and vomiting. Uh, Meniere's disease can present with different degrees of symptoms. So some people might not have you know, much dizziness, more hearing loss, and this can be recurrent. Someone can have it you know, once and never have it again. They could have it you know, once every few years or they can have it more often. The exact cause of it isn't really understood. The treatment is usually steroids for the hearing loss. But basically, these patients are, are, are treated with a low-salt diet and diuretics. It's felt that if you, if you reduce the salt content of the perilymph fluid, that the disease does much better. And then just one more thing I want to mention is noise-induced hearing loss. So this is a very common problem. It's a big seller, as we say. So there are different kinds of noise-induced hearing loss. There's the sudden noise-induced hearing loss. A firecracker goes off next to your head or people that shoot guns without ear protection. And they will immediately notice a loss of hearing. They'll usually have tinnitus at that time. Sometimes they even have a little bit of pain. This often improves, and this, is, this definitely improves when you treat the patients with medication. And usually it would be some type of a steroid to reduce the inflammation in the inner ear. But the main thing we're going to talk about today is age-related hearing loss, known as presbycusis. Presbycusis is similar to presbyopia, which is the, which is the age-related visual loss. So this is not really abnormal. It's just part of life. Some people will um, experience uh, more of it, you know, more severe. But almost everybody at a certain age will have some, some hearing loss. Uh, and this, you know, this comes from multiple things. Uh, it could be due to, um, uh, well, the, the, the common, not the common, the, the reason it occurs is usually damage to those hair cells. So let me just see if I can show you. So I think you can see this. So the, this, this is another picture of the hair cells that line the inner ear of the cochlea. And as time goes by, due to multiple factors, uh, due to age, you, you know, use, uh, um, to toxic medications, genetics, noise, they all take their toll on the hair cells. And typically the hair cells that get damaged first are the ones uh, uh, at the end of this spiral that we have, and that leads to a high frequency hearing loss. Uh, so again, basically the sound would enter the ear, get the little bones moving, get the fluid moving in the cochlea, then the hair cells will move, create an electrical signal which then goes to the brain. Um, I want to just spend a minute, I, I think it'll be useful to show you how we um, how we grade hearing loss and how we uh, are able to objectify it. So let me just show you this. This is a, a normal audiogram, it's blank, and basically it's very straightforward. It shows the frequencies of the sounds on top. These are the sounds we test for. We usually start at 250 hertz, which is a very, very low pitch sound. And then we usually go up to, you know, not really, maybe, maybe to 8,000. And then on this side is the loudness or the sound pressure level in decibel. So what that means is that you put a headphone on a patient, you give them a sound at 250 hertz, and they raise their hand when they hear it. You keep increasing the volume until they hear it. So and that's how a graph is created. This slide um, is, uh, I think, a really good one. It shows a few different things. Uh, so this is an audiogram. And the first thing it's showing you is the sounds that uh, both the uh, pitches, but more importantly, the volume of most sounds in our environment. So if you're out walking around and you hear the leaves, you know, that, that could be about up to about 25 decibels, you know, quiet conversation, birds. Um, this is showing different um, what sounds uh, tend to be uh, heard in the various frequencies. But I want to really concentrate on the, 
volume. So you see a baby crying could be 40 to 70 decibels. A dog barking could be 70 to 90. And then super loud sounds like a jackhammer or a mower or a jet would be, would be a lot higher. And again, this is just showing us the, um, the uh, different types of hearing loss. I shouldn't say that, the different grades of hearing loss. So if your hearing is, uh, if you hear the sounds uh, between zero and 25 decibels, that's normal. I'm gonna show you on another slide. And it just shows you as you come down the uh, graph, how, um, uh, how much uh, sound it would take for you to hear the sounds. So if you have a, a pure tone presented to the ear and the patient doesn't hear it until it gets to 70, and well, that's considered a severe hearing loss. Uh, so just once again, normal hearing is up to about 25 decibels, mild hearing loss, moderate, severe, and profound. So this is a normal hearing test. This is the right, the red lines are the right ear, the blue lines are the left ear, and this person has normal hearing. This is a hearing test that's very typical of people today, of yuppies, people in my category, although my hearing is a little bit worse than this. And you can see that the hearing loss, uh, A, usually is more or less the same in both ears. And this person has a hearing, uh, uh, you know, it takes about 40 decibels for them to hear the sound, then it comes down a little bit. Another very important part of hearing testing is called word recognition, where the audiologist will, will say, you know, repeat the words after me, baseball. And that's very important because if patients don't have good word recognition, it's going to be very difficult to, to help them. Uh, but most patients have reasonably good word recognition. This is another case where the patient has a normal left ear and has a hearing loss on the right side. When someone has an asymmetrical hearing loss like this, usually it's worked up with an MRI of the inner ear because sometimes a benign tumor called an acoustic neuroma can cause this, and that has to be known about. Very often acoustic neuromas aren't treated if they're small. The problem with them is that the head is an enclosed space, and if the tumor gets too large, it'll cause a lot of problems. Also, there are other aspects to it, how the hearing is, uh, to try to preserve the hearing. Certain treatments destroy the hearing. So um, I just want to take a minute and talk about tinnitus. So tinnitus is the perception of noise or ringing in the ears or in the head. Um, anything that affects, it's usually associated with hearing loss, and anything that causes a hearing loss will cause tinnitus. If you have too much wax in your ear, you can get tinnitus. If you have an infection and there's pus behind the eardrum, uh, you can get tinnitus. If you're on an airplane and the plane comes down and the pressure doesn't equalize properly and you get pain, that's from bleeding into the ear. So you can have blood behind the eardrum that will interfere with the hearing. Um, sometimes the jaw joint, which is right in front of the ear, can cause tinnitus. Um, the most common cause of tinnitus, though, is, uh, is inner ear uh, hearing loss or presbycusis. So the theory behind tinnitus, it's not really known what causes it, but the two leading theories, and they're probably both true at the same time, is that the patients will have damage to those inner ear hair cells and they won't be able to function. They break or they fall apart. So what may be happening is that these damaged hair cells are then sending faulty signals to the brain. And this can be interpreted by the brain as these various kinds of sounds. So the sounds could be a constant tone, it could be pulsating, it could be crickets. A lot of people, their first, um, uh, well, actually, today it's a little less often. I'm going to date myself, but a lot of people will say, oh, I think I thought it was the steam in my room. I was lying in bed at night and I heard the steam, but in fact, it's a form of, uh, that, that's usually the most common way it was. Now people will say crickets. Um, the other theory is that the lack of a signal to the brain may cause the brain itself to try to rectify the situation. The brain is used to hearing these sounds or getting this electrical energy, I should say. So sometimes the brain will itself create uh, a, a disturbing uh, sort of a sound. And in most, most likely it's a combination of the two. Just quickly, there's another really bad uh, symptom that sometimes occurs with hearing loss, and that's called hyperacusis. 
So hyperacusis is when certain sounds or certain frequencies become almost painful. Uh, and it's usually associated with those frequencies where the patient has the hearing loss. So this is, I always thought of this as like a, cool, a cruel trick. You know, you have a hearing loss, you, 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 you put, but then everything became too loud. And this is a very, very debilitating problem for people. And sometimes they can't go out. And although hyperacusis isn't as common as tinnitus, they're usually related to each other. In other words, a person with hyperacusis usually will have tinnitus and hearing loss. So I want to go through the treatments for hearing loss. So uh, first, there are some surgical treatments. Obviously, this is a very small percentage of people with hearing loss. But the surgical treatments of hearing loss are as follows. Tympanoplasty. That's when a patient has a hole in the eardrum. And when there's a hole in the eardrum, the eardrum won't be able to move. Uh, it's almost if you imagine a sail on a ship and it has a huge hole in it, the wind is going to go right through that that hole. And that, so patients with a, a, a large enough hole in the eardrum will have a decrease in hearing. And this is usually repaired by taking some tissue, usually from the scalp, under the scalp, and, um, and repairing it surgically. When people have a, a new, a new uh, 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 tympanic membrane uh, perforation, which could be from uh, Q-tip injury. Sometimes people get a slap injury to the ear. It's not uncommon to be at the beach and the water hits your ear and it just it makes a hole in the eardrum. Uh, when that happens in the office, usually what we do is we take a cigarette paper, believe it or not. We, we roughen up the edges of the hole and we place cigarette paper over it. And usually what happens, the cigarette paper works as a scaffold so the skin of the eardrum will grow back. And in most cases, that's work, that works. Um, a second uh, operation that's not as common now, but it's still as it used to be, is called stapedectomy. And this is for a disease called otosclerosis. And otosclerosis is a largely inherited disease, mostly in women. And what, it, what happens is that stapes or that stirrup, that little bone that connects to the inner ear, uh, gets stuck. Extra bone forms around the foot plate of it. So instead of being able to go in and out like this, it, the, the, um, the, the sound energy can't be transmitted. So there's an op there are operations done where this can be repaired by removing part of that foot plate and replacing it usually with a prosthesis. Today it's usually done with a laser, because if you damage that area, you can really damage the hearing. Another uh, surgical procedure, which is not that common, but it has, it has its place, is called the Baja Bone Anchored Hearing Aid. And essentially what that is, it's, uh, it's, a, it, it's um, a titanium uh, uh, fixture. It's actually a surgical screw. It's put, on, it's put behind the ear into the bone. And on top of that, on the outside, fits a little device, which is, the, which, uh, is called the processor. And that hears the sound and it gets the bone vibrating. And when the bone vibrates, it transfers the sound to, those, to the inner ear uh, and it bypasses the little bones in the, in the middle ear. So there are patients who don't have external ears for congenital reasons. There are patients who have terrible, terrible middle ear disease from infection and they do well with this type of device because their inner ear can be normal. Um, also, there are patients with single-sided deafness. So if you hear only from one side, if you, if you put one of these on the bad side, then the sound from the bad side where you don't have hearing will then get transmitted through your skull to the, the, the working ear. And this is actually provides very high quality sound. Uh, there's one other uh, interesting implantable hearing aid called a STEAM. And basically what that is, it's completely different than, than uh, the, the, the other hearing aids that we usually deal with. And what that is, it's a surgery where the uh, eardrum is lifted up and this device is attached to the little bones that vibrate in the middle ear. So this is a completely different concept. This is sort of a, what we call a direct drive. This is not amplifying sound. It's getting the structures in the middle ear to move and then provide, a, and it provides a very good sound. The only thing is it's a relatively big operation and it, and it does damage to the middle ear bones. You really can't go back once you do it. 
Yeah, so I, what I do want to talk about a little more is cochlear implant, and this is for patients who have severe, profound hearing loss, where hearing aids no longer help them. Now, the cochlear implant is a very interesting procedure. When I was training in the early 80s, I assisted on a couple of the first cochlear implants when I was training at Mount Sinai, and it was so interesting. Uh, and the sound that the patients got was very poor, but it was something. But over the years, this has really, really changed. And patients with cochlear implants have really excellent hearing today. So it's a really good option. And it's approved for people with um, profound hearing loss. It's also done a lot in children with congenital hearing loss. So what you can see is that on the outside of the scalp, there is uh, a processor. Uh, behind the ear is a device with a microphone and a battery. And then under the scalp, there is a device uh, that takes the, the energy, or I should say the information from the hearing. It, it's magnetic, it doesn't, so it's not really attached to the other side, it goes through the scalp. And then it sends the, the information through a, a wire which is attached to this array of electrodes that's threaded into the inner ear. So the cochlear implant is a revolutionary thing. It works really, really well and it's really helped a lot of patients. And it's being done now on patients really of all ages. This is how the cochlear implant looks. Um, I'm sure we've all seen people like this uh, with this. Uh, you see, as I was saying, they have the uh, microphone and the battery and the processor, and then this goes into the inner ear and, and uh, provides very high quality sound. All right, so I wanted to, the main issue uh, I really want to talk about is hearing aids and the different types of hearing aids. So let me just for a minute talk about analog hearing aids. Analog hearing aids are really, for the most part, relegated to the past, although I will mention it in a minute. An analog hearing aid is, is non-digital, and basically what it does is it, it amplifies the sound at each frequency, specifically it could be programmed, but that's all it does. It amplifies the sound. Um, it also can be programmed, so if you're in different situations, you can change it so you might hear a little better. But analog hearing aids have really been replaced by digital hearing aids. So what digital hearing aids do is they take the sound and they convert it into digital information. And then with these very powerful computer programs, it tries to fix it. It tries to remove noise. It tries to um, uh, enhance speech. It, 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 but this is basically what digital hearing aids do. So the sound is being analyzed and it's being worked on and changed, unlike the analog hearing aids. So hearing aid styles are just that. They're just styles. Um, most of the hearing aids that are used today are digital hearing aids. I'm going to go through in a minute different styles and what they're appropriate for. But whether it's the in the ear type or behind the ear, these are basically the same technology. So in this picture, we can see the various type of hearing aids. So here we have, these are in the ear, on the left side of the screen are in the ear hearing aids. Uh, the first one is a CIC for completely in the canal. And this is a very popular type of hearing aid. Uh, it uh, is very small, and one of the advantages of it is it's able to use the outer ear to funnel the sound into it. The, uh, the things that are less uh, enticing about it are they usually only have one microphone, and they take getting used to it because there's an occluded feeling in the ear. So, the, so this is basically uh, the CIC. And you know, basically the thing to keep in mind is all the hearing aids are similar. Now there are different levels of technology for sure, and they can do different things, but basically they're all digital hearing aids today. Uh, so on the left side of the screen, we have in the canal and in the ear hearing aids. You don't really see these very much anymore. I used to wear all of these because I've been wearing hearing aids for a long time. But the technology has really evolved that the in-the-ear hearing aids, uh, the, excuse me, the completely in-the-canal hearing aids do a very good job. Now, the behind, uh, then we have the behind-the-ear hearing aids. So you've seen pa patients with very large hearing loss, big hearing loss, w might wear a big aid here, which produces a lot of power, and then they have a custom mold 
and uh, to bring the, the sound into their ear. Um, uh, the open fit hearing aid is a smaller hearing aid, uh, but again, like this one, the sound is produced in the aid and a little tube brings it into the ear. But the workhorse of hearing aids today is the RIC, the receiver in the canal hearing aid. And this is what most people use today. So the RIC hearing aid, it, it, you know, I, I don't know why, and my colleagues all, I don't know why it's called receiver in canal. It really should be loudspeaker in canal. So what, what happens here is in the process of the small area behind your ear, it produces the sound, but the, the speaker isn't here. There's a thin wire that fits in front of your ear and goes into your ear. So this is called the dome, this plastic, this little flexible plastic piece. And this is not a custom thing. There's many different shapes and many different sizes. But under the dome is, is basically the loudspeaker. And what this has done is by bringing the sound right to the eardrum, right to the level of the eardrum, it's able to achieve a lot of things. The problems with hearing aids are the limitations. Uh, one of the limitations is that if the sound gets too loud, you get feedback. And I'm sure most of us have heard people with hearing aids sort of squealing. And, and that's one of the problems uh, with it. So the RIC hearing aid is very comfortable uh, and uh, very versatile. So these are the things that the receiver and canal hearing aids do. It, because the fit of the part in your ear is not tight, it allows certain sounds to bypass the hearing aid and go directly into your ear. So most people with hearing loss have some residual low frequency hearing. By using this type of hearing aid, that hearing that you're able to process without a hearing aid goes bypasses the hearing, it goes right through the piece in your ear. And this leads to a more natural sound. If, if all the sound is being uh, processed, it, you feel like it's helping you, but it's robbing you a little bit. And I, for years, wore in the ear CIC hearing aids. And I knew I understood speech much better, because that's what hearing aids are trying to do, is clarify speech in a noisy environment. But I also felt like I was being robbed a little bit, because it, it took away the naturalness of it. So again, patients who have um, some low frequency hearing, which is actually most people, they do much better with this type of a hearing aid from an acoustic point of view. So it's not just a matter of cosmetics. It's really a matter of what will work better for the patients. Patients who have a flat hearing loss, where it doesn't change in the various frequencies, they tend to do better with the in the ear hearing aid. The other advantage of the RIC hearing aid is there's less stuffiness or the sense of occlusion or a thumb in your ear. And when you wear a, an occluding hearing aid, it does improve, but it takes weeks for, you, for your, real, your brain sort of to not feel it anymore. And there's a lot of pushback from patients about that. The other advantage, as I mentioned, with the behind the ear hearing aids is they have dual microphones, and this gives you much better spatial orientation. Uh, I mentioned already the speaker being next to the eardrum has been a, really enabled uh, to get to higher uh, gain, higher volume, and not having the feedback. And the other issue is that impressions aren't needed, custom impressions, for the most part. Some patients who have certain types of hearing loss will use a RIC hearing aid and will get a custom impression. That might be because for certain hearing loss it helps, and if the, and if the, uh, the part in your ear keeps popping out, the impression will, will often help. Um, so I wanted to talk for a minute about the telephone. So most patients with hearing loss do fine talking on the telephone. And the reason for that is that the telephone compresses all the frequencies. So it's a different type of, uh, of a signal. Um, patients who, like me, who have a little more of a hearing loss, I just have to turn the volume up on my phone. So most people with hearing loss, most, can uh, use the telephone, uh, not even a specially amplified phone, but just turning the volume up is, uh, is usually enough. The thing to keep in mind is that most of the hearing aids that we discussed really don't interact with the phone at all. Uh, if you have the hearing aid behind your ear, uh, it, it doesn't really do the trick. So today, what most people do is they use streaming. Most of the hearing aids today are compatible with our phones, our iPhones, or our Samsung phones, 
uh, Google phones, whatever. And, uh, and with Bluetooth, uh, you could, your phone will transmit directly into your ears. And that's what a lot of people do today. There was, there is a technology called the T-coil, uh, which is not so commonly used today. It's actually an excellent technology. And the T-coil uh, is, a, is a coil that's put in your ear, excuse me, in your hearing aid. And uh, it's used, uh, it can be used for the phone. My experience was never great for that. But if you go for a lecture or you go to, you know, you're in church or a synagogue, they often will, will, take a wire and they wrap it around the room. And what happens is your hearing aid stops being a hearing aid. It's really more tuning into the, uh, to the audio source. So it, and it's wonderful. The, the quality of T coils are excellent, but they're not, they're not that popular today. Part of the reason I think is that the aids have gotten so small uh, and most people today are very interested in using their phones for the hearing. Um, when it comes to unique technology, there's really only two things today available to patients. Uh, as I said, virtually all the hearing aids being used today are digital hearing aids. Some hearing aids uh, might sell for three or four hundred dollars, uh, or they might sell for three or four thousand dollars. And by looking at the aid, you really can't tell the difference. It really has to do with the technology. And the technology means the computer algorithms and the programs that really work on the sound coming into your ear. Uh, one of the, uh, well, I, I mean, let me just skip ahead. Um, so I think maybe people have heard about the Lyric hearing aid. And the Lyric hearing aid is a very interesting uh, device. What it is, it's a disposable hearing aid and it's inserted by the audiologist. It sits in the ear canal. Let me just show you what it is. So it, it's, uh, it sits in the ear canal. I'll show you a picture. It's got a disposable battery. It's not a digital hearing aid. This is the only hearing aid that's not digital. It's an analog hearing aid. But for some reason, when it's right next to the eardrum, it, it produces pretty good sound. And I've used the Lyric hearing aid. But then one day when I was using it, I put a stethoscope in my ear and I had an emergency, so it got pushed in. But, uh, and you see what happens, you go to the audiologist and then they grab this loop and they pull it out and they insert a new one. Usually uh, patients have to have them changed. I think the average is about three times a year. The other thing, uh, here, so let me just show you how it looks. So you see how the sound waves then go to the uh, lyric and then the lyric presents the sound right in front of the eardrum, and the sound is pretty good. One of the negatives with the lyric is that A, um, it has to be changed frequently. The other negative with the lyric is the business model is that you sort of don't own it, you subscribe to it. So it, the prices vary, but it probably, I think the average price in our area is about $3,500 a year. And that's for as many as you need if they break. So they're really not high-tech instruments, but they, it's a clever thing and it works reasonably well. One of the problems with hearing aids in general, particularly uh, digital hearing aids, is that they don't cover all the frequencies. I'm gonna talk now about something I think is really revolutionary and I've been using myself for the past three years and I would say it's been life-changing particularly with my level of hearing loss. So EarLens is a completely revolutionary concept. And what it is, let me show you. Um, the processor here, this, um, the sounds go through the microphone. There are two microphones. These are the buttons if you want to adjust it. Although all these digital type hearing aids or digitally processed hearing aids, they can think for themselves. They, they can evaluate the environment they're in. But this is not a digital hearing aid. But what this is, is the uh, information and the energy, the electrical energy, is goes through this wire, and then it goes to a piece here, which does not send out sound. This is not an acoustic hearing aid. It sends out electrical energy. Then, the, this is the ear lens itself, and this is the most amazing thing. This is a tiny little, custom-made uh, 
lens. It's like a contact lens. Uh, and basically impressions are taken both of the ear canal and of the ear drum. That's never been done before. So this sits in the ear, near the ear drum. And then I mentioned previously the, the umbo. The umbo is the part of the eardrum that's attached to that big bone, the malleus. And basically what happens with the ear, with the ear lens is the, this little motor vibrates and it moves the ear drum and then it moves all the little bones behind it. Sort of similar to that esteem hearing aid I was mentioning, but this does not require any surgery. This is placed by the otologist in the office and we use a little mineral oil, the same way uh, contact lenses work because the tears hold them in place. We use a drop of mineral oil and it sort of sticks to the ear canal and the ear drum. But let me show you why the ear lens is so revolutionary. So when we are born, our hearing goes from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Hearing aids, digital hearing aids, can only produce sound from about 700 hertz to 4,500 hertz. So it's a very narrow band of the sound that's being amplified, but it's enough to clarify speech in noise. Uh, but it doesn't do well with the other sounds. And that's why a lot of the problems with hearing aids are background noise, annoying sounds. Ear lens produces sound from 100 hertz to 10,000 hertz. So I think it's almost triple the bandwidth of, uh, of a conventional hearing aid. So what this means is that um, you, the frequency of the sounds is, is expanded and uh, you're able to hear things you weren't able to hear before. Because the hearing range is extended, the processors, the microprocessor, can also work on fixing those sounds. So you really tend to get a very natural, natural type sound from the ear lens. Um, you know, the, the, in medicine, we have this concept of uh, neural pathways. I showed you the neural pathway from the inner ear to the brain. And the concept today in neuroscience is if you don't use it, you lose it. So I just want to tell you my experience with this. When I first got my ear lens about three years ago, I was told, you know, your brain hasn't heard these sounds, these pitches in 30 years. So it's going to take time for these neural pathways to open up. And this is the concept now, the plasticity of the neural pathways. And sure enough, for the first four or five weeks that I wore the ear lens, at certain pitches, both very low and very high, I would get like a click. It, it just couldn't get through to me. I, was, I knew right away I was hearing better because the, the frequency range was so much better. So the bass was better. Everything it just sounded rich and nice. But after about five weeks, all of a sudden, I started hearing things I hadn't heard literally in 30 years. Birds singing certain pitches. I, I mean, it sounds ridiculous. I started hearing the timber in people's voices. It was just remarkable. The reason why this works so well is that it's not just amplifying sound, it's actually activating the natural hearing mechanism. So the, the two things that we know about this device is that one, uh, it has a way increased frequency range. And the other one is sort of the je ne sais quoi, I don't know if anybody really knows why, but by act, by by not using amplified sound, but by actually moving the, the hearing apparatus, it provides a, a much more natural sound. And I would say now that I feel that my hearing uh, is, is close to normal. And for hearing aid users, I'll tell you, this will mean something to you. When I go to a restaurant, my hearing is perfect. I hear as well as my uh, normal hearing uh, companions. And if you use hearing aids, you know it's the, it's the background sound, the clanging, and it's the, it's the increased frequency range uh, that improves it. So in a nutshell, um, just to recap, uh, the most common kind of hearing loss is age-related hearing loss. It's not really a disease. It's just, you know, it's just part of life. Things contribute to it. Noise, like I said, that's why we have to be very careful with loud sounds. Uh, genetics is part of it. And the goal of hearing aids has been clarifying speech in a noisy environment. And that's what they do. And some people are very satisfied with their hearing aids and some people aren't. Um, 
Okay, that's it.